first, epidemiology and causes of ICH. ICH accounts for 10 to 15 percent of all strokes. We all know that ischemic stroke is the most common type of stroke. But there are about 100,000 cases of ICH in the United States each year, and obviously worldwide, very many more. Problem is, ICH is a particularly challenging treat and carries with it a high risk of mortality and a high risk of long term disability. About 40% of patients with ICH die within the first month, and about one out of five ICH patients is independent at six months. So there's a lot of work we still need to do in order to optimize treatment. So even though it's only 10 to 15% of all strokes, about a third of the years of potential life lost due to stroke overall are due to ICH. It has a high lifetime cost per case, and a total lifetime cost for the annual cases in the United States exceeds $4 billion. So this is obviously a significant public health issue for really all countries. We can divide the causes of intracerebral hemorrhage into primary and secondary causes. Most ICH is due to high blood pressure. And 60 to 70% of ICH is probably due to that. Cerebral amyloid angiopathy is caused, causes, uh, is a re newly recognized cause in the elderly that may go along with dementia and low bar intracerebral hemorrhage. Catacil is an example of a genetic condition. Coagulopathy is an increasing cause, especially as we are using more anticoagulants to prevent stroke in atrial fibrillation patients. And then when patients use amphetamines, cocaine, or other sympathomimetic drugs, that may cause ICH. Secondary causes of ICH are vascular malformations, hemorrhagic conversion of ischemic stroke, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, trauma, a hemorrhage into a tumor, vasculitis, a number of different causes. And I've got that mark through the secondary causes because there are a lot of different secondary causes and here today, we're really talking about primary ICH. We're talking about the treatment, but also the prevention of ICH. And even though the focus of today's talk is going to be what to do with the patient when they have an ICH, I want us all to understand and to emphasize that the long-term treatment of high blood pressure is the single most important way to prevent ICH from occurring in the first place. So managing patients' blood pressure before they have an ICH, and certainly after they have an ICH, is gonna be our very most important thing, and I just can't emphasize this too much. So throughout all of this, remember, blood pressure treatment, blood pressure treatment, blood pressure treatment. Our outpatients with high blood pressure need aggressive treatment to keep stroke from happening in the first place. When we think about the mechanisms of brain injury in ICH, we divide it into primary and secondary mechanisms. Primary would be what happens at the time of the hemorrhage. But secondary is this ongoing injury. And the things that we particularly focus on now are hematoma expansion. But there's an emerging research interest in cellular toxicity of blood products and the concept of neurohemoinflammation. Blood is toxic to the brain. Hematoma expansion is a recognized problem, and it's been the focus of a fair amount of research and hopefully now potential treatments. This is an example of someone with a fairly large intracerebral hemorrhage. This is bad. But when it expands like this, this is fatal. And that expansion tends to happen early on in ICH. So when we focus on the management principles, unfortunately the evidence for the optimal management in ICH is lagged behind evidence for ischemic stroke and subarachnoid hemorrhage, those other stroke subtypes. But we now have improved understanding of outcome predictors, mechanisms of injury, and targets for treatment. And there have been a number of large phase three medical and surgical trials, and we may have some treatments to offer patients from an evidence-based standpoint from these trials. There are a number of different guidelines 
published by different international organizations for the management of acute spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage. Here, I'm going to be referencing the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association guidelines. These are the ones I'm most familiar with. The last version came out in 2015 and involved a literature review through August 2013. So even though there are newer things since then, some of these haven't made it into the guidelines yet. Other organizations, such as the European Stroke Organization, have guidelines as well that are useful for reference. But when I talk about the guidelines in today's talk, I'm mainly going to be focusing on these American Heart Association guidelines. 